by the Mennonites. <laughs> and I, in fact, I ordered the book from a Mennonite publishing house just not too long ago, this, this particular book. And uh, this one is still read by many Protestants. I know, I just finished it a couple of years ago in a newer edition and then passed it on. I don't either. But I just think... Have your picture, please? We'll get started tonight. Welcome to Antiques Depreciation Night at Hedrick Public Library. This evening's program is a collaboration between the library, the Rock County Historical Society, and UW Extension Rock County. Our goal is to empower you to learn more about the items in your attic. When you know what to look for and how to find out more information, you hold the key to unlocking any buried treasures you may have around the house. For the first part of the evening, we'll stay together as a group to hear some tips everyone can use. Reference librarian Jean Yeomans will talk about some helpful library and internet resources for antique collectors. Next, Mary Dickaboom from Rock County Extension will mention publications her agency offers for low or no cost. Laurel Fant, Interim Director of the Rock County Historical Society, will introduce the three local antique dealers who are generously donating their time and expertise tonight. Following some general suggestions for recognizing valuable antiques, our dealers will feature a few items they've selected from antiques the audience brought in tonight. For the second portion of the program, everyone who signed up ahead of time to bring an antique will have a chance to have a brief one-on-one -on -one chat about the piece with one of the dealers. When it's time to break into smaller groups for individual consultations, we'll explain how that will work. Now let's get started with some suggestions from reference librarian Jean Yeomans. Again, my name is Jean Yeomans. I'm one of the reference librarians. If you have any questions about materials here in the library, or whether or not we have materials here in the library regarding any antiques or collectibles, artists, etc., please call us at 758-6581 or come to see us here at the reference desk. We're open when the library is open. So I think I'll turn it over to the gentleman here now to take over the rest of the program. Thank you. Um, well, I guess we have weather in Janesville. Um, I, I just wanted to make a couple of general comments about um, something being valuable, or, or how to determine that, or, or what are what are some some general guidelines. Um, there are two things that I generally think of when I look at items as to whether or not they are of a greater value than something else. And that is whether or not, when they were made, they were made with quality. And the other thing is whether or not that object was absolutely necessary in the time that it was being made. And those things make you learn a little bit about history, and you have to know a little bit about the time of when something was made. You have to know, if you're looking at an object that's from the 1880s, you have to know a little bit about the people and the time and what they did in the 1880s. And to determine whether or not something has quality, you have to look at it much the same as you do today when you go to a store, uh, when you, even when you look for an automobile. You have, to, you have to know good, better, and best. Or you have to at least have a feel for good, better, and best. Um, and then the other thing about it, whether or not it's necessary, many of the things that we find that have a value and an interest today were things that in their time were absolutely not necessary. They were purchased by people who had a little bit of extra money. They were purchased by people who were giving gifts 
they were purchased as as a frill. And that that really holds true still today, because a lot of the things that that people have as objects of art or objects out in a home, even a contemporary home today, are things that they don't really need. They are not essential things. Um, and, and, and that carries over too to furniture. We don't have much furniture here tonight, but that carries over to furniture. The furniture items that, that command the most value today are the things that not everyone has. Everyone had a, a, a common dining room table or a, or a set of chairs, but not everyone had a large bookcase. Not everyone had a secretary desk or something like that. So it, it, it really comes down, when you look at something, um, a, the, the, first, the first thought is whether it has quality compared to like items of the time and whether or not it was really, really necessary. Um, the, um, I, I guess each one of us tonight is gonna, we, we kinda went through here and we, and we looked at a few things and we're gonna talk to, to you about a couple of things, each of us that we found um, out in the audience and then we're gonna break up and, and everybody with their item will be able to come up and, and we'll talk to you individually about it. Um, the first thing, the first thing that, that I saw out in the audience was a um, was this, this this framed picture, and um, what drew my interest initially was the framing and not the picture. If you look at the frame and you look at the back of it, it's the original paper on the back. It's never been out of that frame. The frame is the original frame, and the matting around it, if you come up and take a look at it later on, is a rolled over edged mat. It's not a cut mat like we think of today. It has the, the, uh, the design work around the edge was definitely made for that specific size and that specific <coughs> picture. Then you start to look at the picture. And you say, well, well why, why that series? Why, why that way? Generally speaking, if something is of merit and it's in a frame like that and somebody thought highly of it, they probably had enough money to make a little extra purchase towards the frame and the mat. And it's always been together. Now you have to determine about, about what's in the frame. I looked at it and it's a very well done watercolor. It looks like a print. To most people they would look at it and they would say that that's a print. It's a watercolor and then what drew my attention to it is the fact that it's a night scene. It has a person in it. He has a lantern and that's the focal point. Then I said to myself, I said, well, um, the houses and the scenery and the bridge are not American. So you put all of those things together, and then the next thing that you look at is an artist's signature. And in the lower left-hand corner is an artist's signature. And I looked at it, and like many of the European artists, it doesn't read perfectly. It doesn't, the, the letters are stylized. You can't tell an A from a W. So, so I, I kind of sat here and, and the people who own this and, and Rich and Phil, we all kind of looked at that signature and we, we, we started off with one name and of course that was wrong and then we went to another name and, and, and we finally figured out what it is. The book that we used, we had Gene go and get this for us. The book that we used is Davenport's. It's an art book, very, very good reference book. Uh, probably, the, probably the one that I grab off of the shelf first. It's an auction history book. It has artists in here who have had works for sale at auction. 
uh, it says 200,000 artists. And it gets updated every year. Uh, it's an expensive book. Um, I, I have, uh, it used to be in two or three volumes and now they've reduced it. They've got the print down so that I can't hardly read it. But it's down to a one volume and it's been on the market for a long, long time. What we found in the book is uh, the person's name and it doesn't tell us whether that's male or female. It does say after their name uh, that it's a 20th century artist, which that appears to be a 20th century watercolor. It says that this person was European. It says that, that they did portraits or they did covenants, convents, excuse me. It says that, that the uh, medium that they used for both of those that are listed were watercolors. Um, it also gives a size, an 8 by 11 watercolor and a 16 by 18 watercolor. And this watercolor is probably, I didn't measure it, but it's in between those two sizes. From this point, you now know who the artist is, you've identified that, and you've come up with a, with a general time frame. Myself, I can come down even a little closer, knowing that that's an original frame, it's never been out of there, and knowing the framing, you can, you can come up with a time period of someplace between 1910 and probably 1930. Now, you rely on all of the rest of the books in the library here, and you can find out a lot more information on this person. It lists in here where, they're, where these two were sold and the dates. They were sold in uh, uh, 91 and uh, 91. I can't see it here. Anyhow, it was 91, so since 91, I'm sure that there have been others at other smaller auction houses around the country. You can go to um, Who Was Who. You can go to you can go to a lot of different reference books to find out the exact time that this person was alive and when they did most of their work. Um, just for anybody's uh, uh, the the two that were sold here in '91 were $245 and $500. Um, so, you know, for something that's just been around, that's, that's a pretty darn nice watercolor. Uh, and, and, you, and you, you know, just, just by having a little bit of information and, and dissecting that down and knowing where to go, you can come up with, with a lot more information and, and is all we've done is scratch the surface. And, and that's, I mean, I, I come down here quite frequently if I need more information than what I have at home. And if you have to get more than that, you can get it off of the internet. They have all kinds of resources down here uh, where once you have the basics, once you know that much, then you can go a lot farther. Um, the, other, the other painting is this large one. Can you, you guys hold that up? Um, this was brought in, and, and they started out, they brought in a, a color photograph of it. And uh, I said, oh, that that's, uh, looks very, very nice. Um, it maybe doesn't to some of you, but um, it is a, uh, it's oil on canvas. It's in the original frame. Uh, basically, I could tell those things from the photograph. And I said, well, you know, if you have it here, why don't you bring it in? So, so they did. They had it down in the car, and they were nice enough to bring it in. It's signed in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and, and I initially said, well, that's, um, that's a, uh, an American painting, I think. Uh, there's a number of things that led me to believe that. There's a, a school that's called the Hudson River School. Um, that's a New York uh, type of painting. They did those uh, all throughout the upstate New York and up the Hudson River. Um, the sailboats led me to believe that it was American. 
the types of trees in the background led me to believe that it was American, as well as the frame. The frame certainly looks like something that was a top of the line frame in, the, in that period. I, I thought uh, initially that it would be in the 1870s or 1880s, and they brought it in and set it down and we looked at it. Sure enough, it's signed in the lower right, A. Davis, uh, H. Davis, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, you look at the canvas and the canvas has never had anything done to it. It, it is dirty. Um, it's, it's up to the owner as to whether or not that would ever want to be cleaned. It can be cleaned. It would be very, very much more lively to it, life to it. And there's a little rip in the, uh, in, the, in the fabric of the canvas, but that can be repaired too. Um, so we again went to Davenport's, um, looked up Davis, and you only have the first initial of H, uh, listed as a, as a fairly prominent uh, artist is uh, Harry Davis, Henry Davis, and in Davenport's book, there's a number of listings for Henry Davis. Uh, there's, there's listings as a 19th century American landscape with rivers, uh, and Niagara Falls, boats, animals, uh, goes on and on. And it lists him, it, it shows in here that he's listed in a couple of other books. Um, his dates of birth were 1833. His date of death was 1914. That puts it right in that in that 1870s or 1880s era. Um, I'm reasonably sure that uh, with a little more research on how he signed his paintings, that that you would find that that's that that is in fact that artist. Uh, and and that is this is just not an uncommon thing to have a known artist sign something like that with only their first initial. Uh, these these are the two examples that I'm going to talk about, and and as you can see, both of them were absolutely not necessary to the people who originally bought them, and they were bought as as a gift or as something that was better. Than, than the others around. And because they've survived and because they, they were, they were, there were other artists or the artists did other works and they were good at it, um, they, they then have a value. These, these, were, these are listed, they're all over the, all over the place. Um, uh, anywhere is from, um, anywhere is from 1200, to uh, to five thousand, and uh, uh, that that's a very nice painting, very very good American painting, and it's just in an attic, I guess. Is that where it came from? Was it was it in an attic in your attic, or have you had it out? Uh, it's been hanging in a hall for a hundred years. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to turn it over now to Rich. He's got a couple of things that he's going to talk about, and then uh, we'll go from there. I'm not going to stand up on the podium like Lee does. Lee has to stand behind things all the time. But let Lee work over here a little bit now. Um, first thing I want to talk about is, is this stuff. I can get this out of the way real quick. Everyone knows what this is in the room? Anyone know what this is? Other than a sugar bowl? How many people think it's Fiesta? Raise your hand if you think it's Fiesta. Jewel tea. Jewel tea. This is, this is Harlequin. Okay. It was taken many times for Fiesta. Okay. This came out of a load at our auction. Um, the guy brought it in and said, I have these three boxes of Fiesta that I want you to sell for me. Okay, there was one piece of Fiesta in there. All Fiesta is signed. Um, this is a piece of carnival glass, nice piece of carnival glass. Um, problem with this piece of carnival glass, it was made in about 1960. 
Um, Imperial Glass made this piece. It's a very, you can pass this around a little bit. This is really heavy. I mean, as you can see, it's just, most reproduction glass is really heavy. Those are two things that I brought just to show you those things. Now I want to talk about something that someone out here brought. This bank says, save for victory, make him squeal. <laughs> this is a really neat bank of its time. And it's kind of like Lee said, it's something that wasn't necessary, but it, it made people feel, feel a lot better. Um, it's just a you know, if there's no great, great... <laughs> I'm not very old. <laughs> Everyone in here knows what it means. Did we do this when you were up there? Did we, did we, were we polite while you were up there? Okay. We didn't say that something like Pennsylvania to Dutch or anything like that. When you were up there. Okay. Things like that. It's a Hitler bank because everyone can see Hitler on the front there, right? Everyone remembers Hitler. This, this bank is, is just a really, really neat bank. Thank you for bringing it. Okay. And we're not supposed to say values, so I don't want to say. Right? That's right. We're not supposed to say values, right? Okay. Um, here's another bank that was out there. Lee, hold the mic for me. Hold the mic. That's why you're talking with okay? Good. This bank is from, this is a really early cast iron bank from the 1870s. And it's in magnificent shape. I mean, it all works yet. You put, you put a coin in here, his head goes down, push on his foot, and he fires a coin, fires the coin into the tree. Everyone here? Everyone hear me without the mic? No. That's probably better. No. Oh, I have to use the mic, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you can't hear me, okay? Um, <clears throat> cameramen are a real pain sometimes. <laughs> one thing about old cast iron, one of the nicest things about old cast iron is pretty easy to tell. I used to collect old banks. Um, if you shut your eyes and rub cast old cast iron, I mean, it's just, you can, it's so smooth, it's just, it's, it's, the new stuff has got sand in it. It's just, it's rough. As good a reproduction as they could do for this, they can't ever make it have this patina on it. It's just, a, it's just one of the nicest pieces I've seen for a long time in banks. Um, and it's worth a lot of money, okay? Because I can't tell you how much. It's worth a lot of money. That, that bank, um, you can probably, yeah, you can probably find that bank in like Schroeder's price guide there's, there's, there's under cast bankers. iron yeah, banks, bankers. and then there's um, there must be a, there must be a, a cast iron bank book or a cast iron book uh, that the library How has. thing on the market right now. Uh, but but what all of these price guides, uh, when you find what the item is, then you can go to the price guides and and find out even a little bit more information. Some of them will have more detailed information than others. But that bank, now the Hitler bank, I'm not so sure that you can find that easily because it's, it's a much harder to find that item. Bank is, it's called the Creedmoor Bank, it's listed. In. Okay, and, and, but the cast iron bank, you should be able to find that in most reference books. I just saw this book here, and we do auctions all the time. Um, this is probably the hottest collectible right out in the, on the market today. If you have these sitting around in your attic or in your garage or in your basement, be really careful what you do with them, okay? Because they're selling for four and five thousand dollars a piece. There's empty boxes that are selling for a thousand dollars a piece. Okay, you know there's there's reels that are selling for twenty five thousand. There's there's lures. I think there's lures that are sold for twenty five thousand. I mean, it's just, it's just there's a lot of extra money out there, it seems like, and people are spending it. That's, I, would, I would go home and look for 
tackle boxes. That would be the very first thing I would do. If, or if I knew anybody who had them, I would go look for them. Okay, Phil. Well, what you get to talk. Can you hold I'll hold it tight. I've got some small job. items here, and I apologize. I, I told some folks that I they, they have wonderful items also, and um, I just got too excited, and I, I used my limit up. So anyway, uh, <laughs> we've got some items here that um, we know exactly what they are. We've got some that yes. were disputed, and uh, we've got one that we figured out what it is, not knowing when we started. Uh, maybe I should start with that one. We were going to we were going to do this. I don't know if you can get a close up of this. We we're going to do this as the what's it. Uh, I'll start with the box first. This box was made for this item. Absolutely without question, manufactured for this item. Nothing else would fit in except this item. The little latch on it. I see trunks, of probably from I would say the 1830s or 50s, with this same sort of latch on here. Pipes. And yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, I don't know if you can get a very good close up of this. This this little item is meticulously handcrafted, uh, stamped brass, cut and worked brass. It has. Um, we toyed with the idea of what it was, and um, one fellow thought it was maybe for cutting uh, cigar cigar cutter, but it doesn't cut against anything. This is the cocking mechanism. Now it's it's cocked and this is the, the trigger. So it's a it's a it's very finely made and so I got to thinking when I was out in the hallway, it's gotta be a medical some sort of an instrument and I thought it's I think it's a blood for letting blood. You you would cock this and then come up close to the skin, trip the lever and, and slice into a vein or slice into where you some kind of, but that's what they did back then and believed in it, and so you had to have something to do it, do it with, and, and this item is, uh, is what it uh, Now, this is an American, Native American Indian item. Uh, in Wisconsin, we see a lot of the uh, Winnebago baskets. Uh, you probably have some in your home. You've seen them at uh, antique shops and shows. Uh, they also made this type of work. It's uh, it's a it's a sandwiched piece. There's a cardboard. Sometimes they sometimes they use birch bark, but this has a piece of cardboard in between, and then red trade cloth on the back, trade cloth on the front, and then it's punched and stitched all the way around with threaded cut glass beads and canes that were sliced for decoration. Uh, it's in pretty remarkable condition. It is probably missing the twin over on this corner, but it's very fragile and, and I think it's a miracle that things like this still survive. Um, this item is dated, a lot of them were. It's, it says Montreal, but back then, I mean, the tribes were more, I mean, it wasn't, uh, how do I want to say it? You have to call it, I suppose, Canadian. But you'd find the same thing, uh, Ojibwa, Chippewa, a woodland Indian item, and not, uh, I would say, scarce, and just uh, just a real fun item and a wonderful family piece to have. The next three items um, I got from one fellow, and uh, I hope, I don't know, I, it's going to be hard for you people to see all this, but it's, this is a snuff box. A lot of them were handmade as opposed to being manufactured. That I'm sure this one was. Someone talented, perhaps not, but someone uh, talented in, or in the family or outside the family. It's, uh, it's wonderfully uh, banded with uh, German nickel silver. It's German. Uh, we know that. Josef Vogel or Vogel was is in low German how it's pronounced. It's also dated. Uh, 1918. It's horn, probably cow horn, and then cut and twisted and tortured into this shape and attached with the banding holds it together. Wonderful cutout work on the top here. It slides open here. And uh, Mr. Foster earlier talked about items that nobody needed. 
I would, I guess you could say this, but I think the guy that had his snuff in here, he had to have the schnoz and he had to have the speech <laughs> Anything else or not? So, uh, this, and this piece is also remarkable. Um, I don't know, uh, there we go. On the bottom, again, very difficult for you to see probably, but pasted on the inside, on the, on the bottom of this piece, when it was put together, there is kind of a little naughty lady picture that was cut out of some literature or a, 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 a lithography. It's hard to tell because you're looking through a very uh, fine layer of horn, so blocking the light a little bit, it's difficult to say what it was, but I, but I can tell by the corners. Sometimes these were hand scratched and carved of, uh, like you see on Scrimshaw. And uh, the idea for it, I think, you know, you took your snooze and then you got and was sneezing and everything, and then you could look down at her, I guess, for uh, a <laughs> uh, visual thrill. And uh, they got the idea, um, and a lot of German steins um, were made, and some of them were what we call lift panes. When you tip the cap back and you finish the drink, you look through the bottom of that, and there would be another one of these, probably a little uh, more naughty than this one. Um, uh, this is for this one was made for the uh, family Christian and, and it's made by the same maker. This it's the same work. The work is identical. Uh, made for little brother, I believe, <laughs> Joseph's brother. So at one point in time, this one's smaller. You can see the size different. He was a big guy because he was older and maybe first born, and this fellow came next, and so he got a little bit littler one. But uh, same type of construction, brass tacks holding it together. Uh, great condition. Uh, very, this is, uh, I don't read it, but Untergen von Daner Bruder. So something about the brother here in German. And it's uh, sort of scratch carved with uh, like seaweed and vine decoration all the way around. Really, really wonderful. The third, the third and last piece <coughs> came from the same gentleman. In, uh, we took, we, these are, are I think, uh, snuff containers, and according to family oral tradition uh, history, uh, this also was, but I don't think so. So I'm going to, for fun, I'm going to dispute you. Uh, it looks more like to me, I mean, you can't see it, but I can see on the top here, this was ground for a glass stopper. It had a glass stopper at one time instead of this piece. This piece is marvelous, they made, I mean, very sturdy layers of brass on there, and it fits in there perfectly. So I think at one point in time, the I think this was a scent bottle, a perfume bottle, scent bottle, mm -hmm. and the original stopper was lost, broken, whatever. And so it was, this piece was, was it's a make-do, what we call in the antique business a make-do. Somebody made this, and they did a terrific job of it. And uh, this has seen a lot of use. I'm not so good with the glass colors name, but I think that's, uh, Cranberry. Cranberry. And if you look at the exterior, it, it has a sort of petals and things going down the side, but a lot of use. It had it been in and out of a pocket or purse or something uh, a lot of times, but, uh, but a fine and interesting example. Okay. We're going to have Jean Yeomans come back up for a few minutes to give her a chance to tell you about some of the books that she did gather from the library collection. And then we'll do the uh, breaking up as originally planned. Okay, what I started to say earlier was that we, I'm up here basically tonight to give you a better idea of the kinds of things we have here in the library and can do here in the library to help you find out more about the items you have. Uh, one thing we recommend uh, when you come to the library is to try searching the library's computer catalog. Uh, try a keyword search, naming the items such as a piece of uh, Faustoria glass or red wing pottery or something like that. Try doing a keyword search and see what you come up with. Uh, this afternoon I did uh, a search under, uh, I think I did Faustoria glass and I came up with seven different titles. So we have seven different um, materials, uh, items that we have here in the library that have to do with a Faustoria <coughs> class. Another thing you can do with the library catalog is to do a subject search. And that would be something that's more general. So if you kind of, you know, you're interested in glassware, you're interested in pottery in general, you can do something like that. And then um, the screen will show you 
the subject and then how it's broken down and you can uh, select different lines on the catalog screen. You will, when you look at the results from your search, you will get items such as the ones I have put up here on the uh, book truck. This particular one, the black cart, has items that you are welcome to check out. I've picked uh, quite a variety of things. I've got things, uh, military collectibles, um, something more general such as, uh, let's see, uh, trash or treasure, a guide uh, to buyers, that we have several copies of this, two for, uh, can be checked out and one is in the reference collection which cannot be. So I kind of looked for a variety of things. I have books on jewelry, uh, stamp collecting, um, collecting whistles, which I didn't know people did. <laughs> so I learned something doing this. Um, all different books on uh, appliances. We have, uh, not appliances necessarily, but radios, antique radios, uh, military, I said I think before, baseball cards, basketball cards, and so on. So we've got a variety of things here. Also, I brought some books from the reference collection some of which there are duplicates in the circulating collection, but these stay here all the time. Uh, I'm trying to think of one. We have a dictionary of furniture. Uh, let's see, the American Antiques. So some of these books are a little older, but they have lots of good information in them. Others are brand new as of this year. So you can see we've got a variety of books here. We also have magazines, and I also brought those, some of those. We have, this particular one is called Collector Showcase. It's a, um, more Disney and animation art. So that's available, uh, back issues are available for checkout. The current ones are not. So if you're interested in any of these kinds of magazines to check out, um, you're welcome to do so. Football card monthly. Uh, I think we've got basketball card monthly is also here. I'm gonna skip baseball, we've got lots of sports. We have general collectibles. This particular one is called Collector Showcase, and this issue features Pooh Bear um, necessities from the Hundred Acre Wood. So there, each magazine, uh, whether it's published weekly or monthly, will feature some item that people might be interested in and, and do give you some more detailed information, people to contact, etc. Um, in terms of appraisals, or we happen to know quite a bit about that item. Uh, the magazines will also uh, list shows that are coming up or uh, results of recent auctions to give you an idea of some of the prices people have paid for the different collectible items or antiques. This particular one is called Antiques and Collecting. So if we go up, go the other way from collectibles and go into the antique and fine art, things we have different magazines having to do with that. Um, this one, the magazine Antiques is a good example of a fine arts antique collectible magazine or collector's magazine. This is something you want to look at uh, for paintings such as these possibly. Okay. And for people interested in collecting coins, we have the num Numismatic News and that I believe comes out if weekly, if, uh, if not, then it's monthly. We also have old cars, weekly news, and marketplace. And then we also have, I don't know who is this, uh, the Antique Trader, which is very popular. I'm sure most of you have heard of this one. So we have a variety of magazines uh, available here in the library. Uh, the, again, the back issues are ones that you can check out, uh, the most recent issue will be over um, on the stacks next to the, the Woodruff Training Room. In the reference collection, again, we have more specific things. Um, we mentioned Davenport before, uh, as well as Dictionary of Art, uh, some other titles. We have, uh, I think, about four, maybe six to eight different shelves uh, in the reference collection, in the lower shelves across from the reference desk, uh, full of books about art. Um, and antiquities as well as collectibles. So that's the 700s in, in Dewey Decimal System is a good place to go and to look for those. Another thing you can do is to uh, look at any of the, use any of the computers in the reference department that are internet accessible. Uh, use WISCAT, which is short for the Wisconsin Catalog. 
that lists collections in libraries around the state. So if we don't have a book on, say for example, um, I'm thinking Disney collectibles, which we do, but in case we didn't, uh, we could check on WISCAT to see if any other libraries had it, and you could do an interlibrary loan and get that book. So WISCAT is a wonderful resource for us because none of us can have all of the books about antiques and collectibles, so it's a great resource to use to find books we don't have here. Newspapers uh, here in the library, I'm specifically going to focus on the Milwaukee Journal, Sentinel, and the Wisconsin State Journal, and again, specifically on the Sunday issue. And I, some of you probably are already aware of this. They publish a magazine that appears each week okay, with information about antiques, collectibles, whatever, anything that's on the internet. What they do is they review websites. So this particular issue is from January 9th, and it, I believe this is the one where they uh, talked about the online auctions, all the auctions on the internet, and how popular the internet auction arena has become. eBay is one I'm sure most of you have heard of. Uh, other auction houses and other people have online auctions at this point in time. They're becoming much more popular now. Uh, this April 9th issue uh, just does a little um, set of website reviews on stamp collecting. So each week when you open your Sunday paper, you can find this particular magazine and there may be some article uh, reviewing websites in your area of antiques or collectibles. So it's, this is a wonderful resource. Uh, we have, though, these should be with the Sunday papers, uh, unless they've walked out of the library after we've gotten our Sunday papers. But these should be with the Sunday papers, either on the rack or back you know, with the past issues. Going back, I mentioned the internet earlier, and it, um, in fact, it just kind of, the internet weaves in and out of all of this. When we uh, help people find information about their um, antique or collectible item, we generally start by doing a search on one of the search engines, such as Yahoo, Excite, Alta Vista, any of those you can use. What you need to do to search those is try to be as specific as you can. Sometimes you don't start out with um, art pottery. You're going to end up with way too many sites to search through. You want to try to be a little bit more specific. Sometimes too specific isn't going to get you much, but try to be as specific. Go for wet Red Wing Crocs or, um, or something like the, the military collectibles going, you know, Civil, Civil War weapons or something like that where you want to get a little more specific yet uh, not too specific. And what you'll get is a list of websites that have something to do with that particular item. Some of them may pull out the word civil and get into civil litigation. You know, so you'll see things that don't necessarily apply. But for the most part, you should be able to get things that relate to your particular need. So try using search engines. Look at the different results and be aware that some of the, of the websites have not been updated for a long time. Others are <coughs> updated hourly even, especially the auction websites that are updated all the time. But be aware that, that there are also people out there who are not um, necessarily um, good traders, good dealers, whatever. And the same thing goes for, for people who are buyers. They don't, especially with eBay, you have that, you know, dealers go through that um, particular risk too, where people will not pay for what they just purchased by the auction on the internet. So you have some um, tools on eBay and other auction sites where you can uh, find out more about how they run the website, how the auctions are run, as well as more information about the sellers. Uh, Sotheby's Auction House has a website, as do other major auction houses. Uh, so be aware that they're out there too. It's not just eBay, uh, but it's the one that's gotten the most publicity. In fact, they even have a magazine that's coming up. We'll have a first issue next month uh, that'll be available for people to look at. Uh, let's see, I think the last thing I'm going to talk about is the handout that I believe everyone got when you first came in, and that has to do with appraisals. Oops. The key here to remember is talk to experts. Talk to gentlemen, this is the people we have here tonight. Okay, talk to professionals who know what they're talking about. Okay, 
Uh, we put at the top of the page, in the, I think it's in the second paragraph, we listed two appraisal associations in the United States. Uh, the first one is the American Society of Appraisers, and the second is Appraisers Association of America. We put their phone numbers as well as their addresses in case anyone wants to contact them for information about who in our area is a registered appraiser with them or um, is on their list. Also, uh, we put um, two auction uh, and appraisal firms uh, in Chicago who will do online, or I should say Butterfields will do online, Sotheby's will do by, uh, free informal appraisals by mail. So it's kind of a nice resource for everyone. You can send a photograph in with a, a good detailed written description as well as a stamp self-addressed envelope and they will send in a month or two um, the results of your appraisal. Butterfields also does this online. They will do it via email. Okay, you can scan your photo um, and send that with your email uh, to them and they can do that as well as you can call and get more information or write them for more information. So what we gave you in this handout is just a little bit more information about professionals uh, in our region who can help you in determining the value or identifying the object you may have. Okay? I think what I'll do now is I will pass the torch on to Mary Dickable, who is the family living agent with the UW Extension Rock County. I really uh, wanted to uh, just share with people that there's a table of Laurel Fant, Laurel and I and Linda have worked together to make this program possible. Laurel is the interim director for the Rock County Historical Society. And I'm feeling like people are anxious to move into their groups of three. Let me explain what we're going to do next. We have uh, the three antique dealers here tonight. Lee Foster with City Hall. Rich Rand from Lloyd Auction Services and Phil Shower from Ipswich and me. They will each be at one of the tables around the room. Please, you may choose to go to any of the three. They, if, if they don't have an answer about your antique, they'll send you to one of the others who may, they may think has a better answer. Um, so if you'd like to pick one of the three, line up behind, you know, line up at that table, and they'll talk about your antiques with you. Please feel free to eavesdrop and learn about other people's antiques and what they have. And also please um, take a few moments so that everyone here can have a chance to learn about their antiques. Thank you. Seen. Now you should be able to find this. Um, I, I called a couple of people that they gave me from the library, and I never got the other bees. I think. Okay, yeah, but, but you're not going to get it to them. You should be able to find this. It could be in one of the reference guides on the Westmoreland glass or under milk glass. Now that Schroeder's book under milk glass is probably the best as a price guide, but you have to get the pattern first. And I don't know what they call this pattern, but there's a whole series of editions in this pattern. Yes. So it's got to be something like, I mean, it'll be something like uh, pyramid or diamond and cube or something like that they'll call it. All right? And you find that pattern, and this is a covered compound, measure the height, and then you can find a price guy. Price guy. Price guy. Price guy. Just it's perfect. Oh yeah, and they all did. And, and, and because of the way that they fit, because of all of those little ridges on there, a lot of them find a crack and chip. Not necessarily a crack, a chip. Because every time you put that top on there, it would be hit a little bit long. But, this is in um, perfect shape. Yeah, and, and that's what it is. I get done with it. That's, that's what okay. it is. Just so I just, where do I, what's the, I, I wouldn't even know where to start looking for that. That's a hand-picked shade. It's hand-picked shade. Yeah, it really has a baby infant bed. Right. 
back. Oh, these are our relatives. Yeah. I had one with the phone. Or they the were. Cover, we yeah. Didn't know at all. We right. Now, see, the back of this is what most of them would have been. It would have been that velvet with a with an oak cover like this. Um, it makes it much more unusual. Uh, I I have only seen a few with with an with a wooden cover like this. Most of them are just this velvet, velveteen, or even the more common one is paper. Um, and this is, and it had a wash on it that was probably a, a silver wash and it's just worn off. Yeah. And um, and that, if you go up to the Tallman House, the, uh, <laughs> the, the knobs and all of the all of the metal work, the hinges on the doors are all the same thing. They're, they're silver plated over brass, and it just wears off the time. It'll just wear right off. That is not pot metal. Okay, pot metal would be something that would be much lower in value, much less desirable. And some of them had just a stamped piece of hot metal on the front that said album or photos or my album or something like that. That's a that's a very good example of, uh, of those. And, and again, 18, uh, uh, 1880s, 1890s, very Victorian type of thing. Was this one the one in the box or was the... This is the Coleman one? Yeah, this is, uh, you, you know, the, the best part about this is the shade. Right. <laughs> that's, that's hard to believe, but, um, you know, without, without the shade, uh, uh, it, it's not nearly as, as enjoyable as with the shade. Um, and the problem with these paper shades was they deteriorated so quickly with the heat. And, and then, you know, you were supposed to be able to go and buy another shade, and then didn't work. Aladdin did the same thing. There's, I don't know if she's got it out here, but there's two or three books on Aladdin. One of them is on electric, and one of them is on, on some, some later ones that were, that were kerosene. And they had a shade, a paper shade, that fit on them, and the paper shades just deteriorated. As soon as you got it, they just were shot. Um, and this one, obviously, has been boxed up and, and put away. Uh, you should be able to find, um, in the Aladdin one, you should be able to find one that's comparable in Aladdin. Okay. Uh, I don't know of a Coleman. Uh, you might have to go to um, to one of the general price guides under lighting. Um, what do you have? The best thing to do instead of carrying it around would be to take a, just a Polaroid. Uh, you should be able to get a model number off of here or off of the box. Yeah, model 152. Um, I would com I would start out by comparing it to an Aladdin. That's be all right. There was a lot of competition there. Um, Age-wise, I think you're looking at at the, at the late 40s or the early 50s. It might be before World War II, but well, it could be. It could be. It could be in the. As, you know, there's a huge gap there. You're either in the 30s or you're in the 50s because of the war. All right. And as soon as the war got over and they were making stuff like this, they were making the low end stuff to get it back out on the market. And they weren't they weren't dealing with any of the, the special requests and the kind of higher end. Um, uh, and, and it might be from the 30s. Uh, I tell you what else you can do is um, look for a patent number on it. There's a listing of patent numbers, and if you've got the number. They have here in the library a listing of patent numbers that to a cutoff date of December 31st every year. So you get a patent number and you can go back and you can tell which year it was for that patent. But then you've got to go forward from there because it doesn't necessarily mean that it was done in that first year of the patent. Um, but if you can find 
reference any Coleman catalogs when you read it over. It would be the other way to go about it and find a Model 152. This is 125. They didn't make Model 1 in the first year and 2 in the second year. Are they okay? So, we have a book on Okay. But not in just kind of a history. Oh, yeah. Well, you won't. I, I don't. I would, uh, you know, um, something like this in that good a condition, a price. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's been one really established on the market. Uh, you, you know, it's one of those things that is condition means so much. Um, and and it could be one price today and another price tomorrow. Prices, I, I, I mean, something like that, I, you know, I just, you'd be taking a guess. I mean, I could, I could, well, I, I like it. Okay. Um, there's no question about that. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing, especially with the box. If I if I walked into a house someplace and it was just sitting there, um, I wouldn't hesitate to spend two hundred dollars. I have no idea. What it's worth. But but my mind and and everything else that's going along with it, I say, I don't know, that's, you know, two hundred bucks is not bad. For that. Sure, we always you know, I'd spend that in a second. Now, it might be worth two thousand. I don't know. But that I know that's if I saw it sitting someplace, I know that I wouldn't hesitate to pay that for it. Is it or back in the hand? No, it's all you need is the form. It's all you, oh, you can take a camera, yeah. You can take a camera shot of it. It's just, I, I always take Polaroids because it's one shot and I can carry it around and then they don't bend in my pocket and all of that kind of thing. The price is on the box. That's what it costs. Eleven ninety five, sure. Yeah. And the shade matches the picture for that. Oh, yeah, it's the right shade. There's no question about that. I, I wouldn't question that. In fact, here again, you've got a case where uh, Rich was talking about with toys. Um, the box, with the box alone, is worth nothing or, or very little. The box with the lamp increases the value by probably twice. But you wouldn't have this shade on this lamp if you didn't have the box. So you know you, you, you're, you're kind of dealing with that uh, with that scenario that it's like. Well, I wouldn't have had this if it weren't for the box. And, you know, it's static dust. It's been sitting. Yeah, and it's so very I would never, ever put fuel in it and use it. I would never do that. So I... I <laughs> the right person has it because I don't like it when I like it. <laughs> you're just, I mean, it, it is too perfect.